Hello, and welcome to another episode. In this episode, I'm going to try and do something quite different to my usual episodes and do some astronomy in the wild, and hopefully inspire you to do the same. It's becoming increasingly difficult to see the night sky in today's modern world. Light pollution has been slowly diminishing what we can see in the sky. In London, where I'm usually based, the sky is orange and only the brightest stars are usually visible with the naked eye. So I really need to go off the grid to find somewhere that's remote enough to be dark and in a country like the UK where the town and cities are quite packed together it'll have to be quite a journey to get away from the light pollution. To do this I decided to go to Dartmoor, a national park in Devon, a county in the southwest of England. I decided to go to the northern section of Dartmoor as this is far away from any other habitation and the nearby Exmoor National Park so it should be quite dark. I have displayed a map in the bottom right corner of the video to show my progress towards my target location. Another reason I decided to go to Dartmoor is that it's the only part of England where it is legal to go wild camping, meaning I could camp anywhere barring a few restrictions, one of which is that you can only sleep in a one or two man tent. So I got my camping gear, some supplies and a good pair of hiking boots and headed off. At the start of this journey I immediately sprayed myself with a lot of mosquito repellent to try and keep what would turn out to be some of the most determined insects I've ever encountered away. Dartmoor itself is a wild place. It consists of moorland and a lot of tours. These are hills with exposed granite peaks, one of which is our target for this trip. It's a tour called Black Tour, about 10 miles from a town called Oakhampton. Another issue with Dartmoor is it consists of a lot of bogs which consists of peat and can be quite deep. These bogs are particularly prevalent because the moor is rarely dry, as it receives much more rain than the surrounding lowlands, causing them to never dry out. This, combined with thick fog and mist that Dartmoor receives, has been responsible for the many deaths over the centuries, as people accidentally wander into bogs. Unfortunately, this bad weather does not make Dartmoor ideal for stargazing, so I made sure before heading to the moors that the weather was going to be fairly clear. To get to Black Tor, I roughly had to follow the West Oakman River. To do this, I first had to get to the Melbourne Viaduct. Once I got to the Melbourne Viaduct, I could see right down the valley towards Melbourne Reservoir. I noticed that the reservoir, which supplies a lot of the drinking water for local residents, was very low due to the recent hot weather. Unfortunately, I stupidly only took a litre of drinking water, believing that it will be enough to get me to Black Tor at which point I could use my water purification tablets to get more water from the nearby river. Unfortunately, that water is now running low, and I am parched. I head through the valley. It's hot, and I am sweating a lot at this point. Confusingly, the trail I was following leads into a large patch of heather, and I mean large. Most of the valley side was covered with thick, prickly heather. Not seeing any other way through, I push on. The insects are having a field day, especially as I am only wearing shorts. After an hour or so of walking through this heather, I reach a large area of bogs that slows my progress even further. This part of the journey took far longer than it should have done and put me a bit behind schedule. However, eventually I reach a very old, well-trodden pathway that I believe I missed on the way in, which would have gone from the reservoir to the Black Tor, avoiding all of the heather. Anyway, you live and learn. I finally get to Black Tor and dump my heavy backpack in some ferns and head down the hill to the river with my large 8 litre water bottle. This is when the fun begins. Almost immediately upon getting to the river and starting the process of collecting water, a massive swarm of midges, probably more than 300 insects, descends on me. And while the repellent I put on in massive quantities seems to have some effect, with the number of insects involved, a lot get through and I get about 50 or so bites in total. But that's what you've got to go through for clear skies. So at this point I am very dehydrated, so I shove all of the water purification tablets in the water bottle and set a timer for the tablets to take effect and get back up the hill. The tablets will have done their work in 30 minutes. I can't wait for it to finish. I am so thirsty at this point it's unreal. I head back up to the top of the hill and almost predictably I can't find my bag that I hid in the ferns. However, after about five minutes of searching, I find it. At this point, I am quickly losing the light, so I set up my camera. As you have to remember those astrophotography priorities, and then quickly start setting up my tent. I have got a light one-man tent for these and perhaps future trips to make it easy to camp when hiking. 
Fortunately, the tent is easy to construct. I have it all ready as the sun is going down. While I brought food to cook, I decided not to, as it would have taken too long with the sky is quickly going dark, and so I just have some breakfast bars. Now, I had been monitoring the weather for about a week before this trip, and it didn't look like it would be possible with the dark moor weather appearing to be partly cloudy at best. However, this was the best day of the week to do it. Fortunately, when I was there, the weather cleared, giving bright, clear skies, in, and in those conditions, it didn't take long for the stars to emerge. As the stars emerged, the midges departed, which was a relief as the bites were almost constant at this point. It was immediately obvious that the sky was going to be exceptionally dark. Before long, there was hints of a ribbon appearing across the sky. This soon turned into the Milky Way. What was great about seeing the Milky Way was that you could easily see the dark lanes in the Milky Way from one horizon to another. This is a great indicator of a truly dark sky. Looking around, the night sky constellations appeared insanely bright. Asterisms like the Big Dipper or Plough were so bright, it was almost unbelievable that it was some, I would sometimes struggle to see all of the stars of the asterism in London. The sky looked like a vast sky of jewels, with more stars than I'm used to seeing. Everywhere I looked, there were more stars to see. This combined with the fact that there were regular meteors falling, as you may see in the time-lapse footage, this was because I was catching the build-up to the Perseids peak, which made the whole night awe-inspiring. I noticed Sagittarius with a famous teapot asterism, something that I rarely see as you need to have a low, clear horizon to see from my latitude. As I looked around the night sky, I noticed that I could just about make out the Andromeda Galaxy, the furthest object visible with the human eye at about 152,000 light years. So I set about capturing the Milky Way. I used a Canon M100 with a 24mm Canon Pancake lens. Unfortunately, while the camera is good for the price, it doesn't support an intervalometer, which would be a problem as it intended to take a lot of photos. While it is possible to connect the camera from your phone and control it that way, the default Canon app isn't very flexible. Fortunately, there is an Android app called Camera Connect and Control that gives me all the features I need for a small payment. After taking a few test shots in which I checked for star trails at various exposures, I set off for a 7 second exposure at an ISO of 2500. This gave me sharp stars. I built up a large bank of captures and later processed the results using the free Windows application Secretor to give me this amazing photo. I especially like how the black tour is in, in the photo to give the galaxy some context. I then captured Andromeda. Using the same settings, I captured about 50 shots to give this stacked image. What is great is that if you zoom in, you can actually see Andromeda's satellite galaxy, M110. Finally, as the clouds started to come in, I noticed that Jupiter had come across the sky and decided to try and take my last few shots, focusing on the planet just poking above the granite rocks of Dartmoor. At this point, the wind had picked up and black clouds were racing across the sky, so I quickly packed everything away and got into the tent. The next morning, I awoke to a different world. I worked with rain and wind and thick fog in every direction. I quickly made some breakfast and packed everything away. I headed back the right way this time along the hilltops and not in the valley, making it back to the reservoir in half the time it took to get there. Fortunately, the weather had turned at this point, and from the weather reports, it wasn't going to get any better for the rest of the week, so I departed the moor. However, I was very happy with what I managed to capture in such a short time under such great skies. Well, that's all for another episode. I hope you especially enjoyed this one. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. If you would like to see more of these wild astronomy episodes, then please mention it in the comments or like the episode and I'll start planning another one. Remember, to see more astronomy episodes, please do subscribe. Goodbye and clear skies.